I don't know about you, but I love a good celebration, a good party, a good festival type event. I, I love every time that me and my family get to be the, together to celebrate maybe a holiday that we celebrate here in the United States of America, or we celebrate a special occasion in our family, or maybe we're just celebrating the fact that we have friends. I love celebrations. And in tonight's Bible study, from morning to a good day, we're going to look at how to celebrate God. And um, if you've been following along with us over the last uh, six lessons, you would know that we have been studying through the book of Esther. And in last week's lesson, we saw where Esther and the king and their adversary, the Jews' adversary, Haman, was found out and uh, put to death. He was hanged in the very gallows that he built for, uh, for Mordecai. And tonight in chapter 9 of the book of Esther, we're going to see what happened directly following those events. And, and like I said, we're going to study how it is that we're supposed to celebrate God, to celebrate all that God has given to us. You know, we as Christians, yes, we understand that we go through trials. We're going we're to see that. That just because the decree had been had had went out and uh, the Jews were able to protect themselves, it does not mean that the battle was over for them. In fact, it continued. God gave them victory. We'll see that in tonight's lesson. But but it does mean that uh, we as Christians we should be able to praise God and have times of great rejoicing and praise that He is our God. He is that God, the God who created the universe and, and, and how we celebrate as Christians. Around these parts of the world, in the state of North Carolina, uh, college basketball is a pretty big deal. Uh, I, I love college basketball. In fact, I'm a Tar Heel fan and have been my entire life. And uh, one of the great celebrations of college basketball comes every March in what we call March Madness. And at the end of the tournament, uh, of course, the confetti falls down and uh, there's a great celebration on the court and uh, the, the players are celebrating, the coaches are celebrating, the fans are celebrating. In fact, it was just a couple of years ago uh, that one of our local teams, uh, North Carolina Tar Heels, uh, played Kansas for the national championship in the Superdome in New Orleans. I was privileged to be there. It did not turn out the way that I would have liked for it to turn out, but saw the confetti fall and everything and everybody is celebrating or everybody that won was celebrating this event you think wow you know it's awesome to be a part of a celebration it's not great to be on the other side of that but it is always fun to celebrate things it brings joy it, it, it brings laughter many times sometimes it brings celebratory cries every so often what it brings is this awkward camera view of a person who does not know how to celebrate. They've been in the battle so long, maybe uh, I, I think particularly of, uh, of a football event where uh, the competitors have been hitting each other throughout the event, maybe even uh, the winner of a boxing match and who has just taken a beating per se, but yet they won. And every so often you'll find somebody who does not know how to celebrate. And I think the typical response for those watching is, is he not glad for what has taken place in this event? Is he not happy uh, about you know the victory that he has? And you, and you sometimes think maybe he doesn't even appreciate what has taken place. And for us as Christians, you know what could turn into uh, what we saw last week, uh, where several, even those that lived in the Persian Empire, the the Gentiles is what we would call them. They became believing Jews because of what God had been doing. And praising God and celebrating God for who he is certainly becomes contagious. And we're going to see all that in tonight's lesson of from morning to a good day. To remember God's faithfulness to, to the Jews, the Jews created a holiday called Purim. We're going to talk about this holiday that happens in March even to this day. And this holiday was built based off the book of Esther. 
and it is to celebrate God's deliverance in their lives and, and to teach those succeeding generations of Jews what God had done for them all these many years ago. And once again, for us in tonight's lesson, what we're going to learn is we're going to learn how to celebrate God's salvation in my life. That we can see that God can turn a day of mourning, what was supposed to be a horrible day, a day of annihilation for the Jews, into a day of rejoicing in Him. In fact, in Esther chapter 9, and once again, we will study out many of these verses as we go through the points of tonight's lesson. Uh, we'll, go, we'll cover most of the chapter, but I can point you to verse 22 as we begin, where it says that, that he turned that day, he turned unto them from sorrow to joy and from mourning to a good day. And, and you know, that's what I think about uh, when, I, when I have memories of, of holiday celebrations, of family celebrations, of friends celebrations, of of even athletic celebrations that I've been a part of, and you think, man, <laughs> that was a good day. That was a good day. The day I got saved was a good day. The day that I got married was a good day. The day that my children were born, it was a good day. The day that my children trusted Christ as their personal savior, was a good day. I mean, we relish in those good days as we can you as we take the terminology here uh, from the book of Esther and and how to celebrate those good days because often the seasons of life can be very difficult. They can be very emotional. But with God's grace and trust in his sovereignty, which is a word that we've been talking a lot about here in the book of Esther, where, where God himself is not mentioned, but we can definitely see God working in every situation in the book of Esther, that, that these emotional, these difficult days can become bearable and many times even create great victory in our lives. No one can testify to this truth like Esther, like the Jews living in Persia during the time of Esther. But it hasn't been the only time for the Jews that they have faced that. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, anti-Semitism is still very much a problem in today's world. It, it, is, it is very much a problem. You could even uh, look at recent days and, and those who would seek to do harm to, to Israel. And, and that is why Christians, uh, it is a biblical point of view to stand with Israel and, and, and to publicly decry any sort of anti-Semitism that there is. In 2021, the American Jewish Committee published a study that concluded that many American Jews are changing their behavior, limiting their activities, and concealing even their Jewishness due to concerns about anti-Semitism. Four out of ten American Jews say they have changed their behavior simply out of fear. Out of fear. 25% of these people avoided posting content online that would reveal their Jewishness or views on Jewish issues. 22% refrained from publicly wearing, carrying, or displaying items that might enable others to identify them as Jewish. I couldn't imagine this type of fear. 17% avoided certain places, events, or situations out of concern for their safety or comfort as Jews. This, this, this uh, study said that many of the younger Jews, those ages 18 to 29, have, changed that, that have said that they change what they do to conceal their Jewishness. That happens still today. But in this time, they were given a, a cause for celebration that still is observed in today's world. The, the 12th day of the month... Which for which mentioned here in scripture, it's mentioned as Adar as the twelfth day of the month. That would be our March, and the thirteenth day of this month was supposed to be, according to Haman's declaration, the annihilation of the Jews. But as we saw in last week's study, uh, God had used Esther and Mordecai to protect the Jews from this decree, and. Uh, 
We know that Haman was hanged on the very gallows that he built for Mordecai. We know that Ahasuerus had put it in the hands of Esther and Mordecai to write a proclamation in order to uh, to counteract the previous proclamation that had been proclaimed that on this day the Jews could rise up and they could protect themselves and God's hand of protection was once again seen over his people and as it has been many times in history you know uh, what was supposed to be a horrible day once again a day of mourning turned into a good day and sometimes those are the best days I think about looking at pictures of one of my favorite time periods to read after in American history of World War II and and you see the pictures of those going off into battle and, and the time of uh, uh, directly after Pearl Harbor and, and and those particular dates where many of our young men gave their lives and sacrificed uh, for the cause of liberty uh, and freedom for all. And, and it, it wasn't a great day. But then you also look at pictures of uh, of, of, of VE Day and, and, and VJ Day and, 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 uh, and, and those pictures of just straight joy and, and celebration that they had been delivered a great victory. Over the past couple weeks, we have seen a very dark hour in the in the history of the Jewish nation facing annihilation. But today we see that aftermath uh, of this uh, celebration of God's intervention and salvation. That in so much that even the non once again the non Jewish leaders in Persia were able to get behind him because celebration praise is once again contagious. Esther chapter 9, verse 3 and 4, I said we're, we'll study these out uh, individually. In verse it says, And all the rulers of the province, and the lieutenants, and the deputies, and the officers of the king helped the Jews, because the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. For Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame went out throughout all the provinces. For this man Mordecai waxed greater and greater. And today we see the these wonderful results from Esther, uh, Esther's plea to Ahasuerus and how he even responded to that. The first thing that we see is we see the protection of the Jews. Once again, we learned last week, we left off on this point last week, that the Jews, uh, that Esther and Mordecai had been given the ability to write a decree in the king's hand they because of the laws of the Medes and the Persians that previous decree could not be rescinded rather another decree had to be made in order to counteract it and he said on this day Jews are, are able to, um, to 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 bear arms and to protect themselves and they did this and they did this but once again it didn't stop those who would seek to destroy God's people to take up arms against the Jews and they did just that. And but yet we see where God gave them protection. And they gave he gave them protection also in the fact that he that they had the king's favor on them. They had earned the king's trust. It's interesting that the king noticed something different about the Jewish people. We talked about this at length last week. I think it's one of the most important things to learn from last week's lesson of how Esther dealt with Haman. And, and how her actions and her attitude remain consistent of that would be becoming of a Christian, not unbecoming of a Christian, but that would that would would be becoming of a Christian. And that's exactly what happened here. The actions of the Jews, the attitude of the Jews was that becoming of God. Verses number 10, 15, and 16 tell us something that the king noticed. He noticed that, um, verse number 10 says, but on the spoil, spoil laid they not their hand. In verses 15, but on the prey they laid not their hand, but they laid not their hands on the prey. In verse number 16, it's mentioned three different times of the Jewish restraint to those that, that had, during this time, once again, that, that decree from Haman went out, and, and on that day, the there were several who did still choose to attack the Jews, even though they were capable of protecting themselves. But of every person that that the Jews had become victorious over, Ahasuerus noticed that they didn't take the spoils. They 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 did not uh, they, they they did not seek vengeance in this 
time of God giving them vengeance. You know, the Jews were defending themselves. They, weren't, they didn't seek after this war. And the fact that they didn't take of the spoils of war gave a strong testimony even to the purpose of their fighting. And Ahasuerus noticed that, and he, he, they gained favor because, because of that. You know, in today's world, we as Christians, we, we are required to take a stand. And we should stand. And we should stand for the truth. And at these times that we stand for the truth, we must remember that we must do it in an attitude that is becoming of Christ, our namesake, as being Christians. And I, I guarantee you one thing, people will notice. They'll notice. They'll notice the reason for which you rise up and take a stand for something. Sometimes, you know, uh, people would maybe accuse somebody of taking a stand for, may maybe it's to gain uh, fame or, or to gain uh, monetary privilege or whatever it may be. Maybe uh, wanting to win or to rise up for something other than, than the cause of Christ. But the real purpose of standing for Christ is that, why, is that we can bring glory to him and lead lost souls to him. So when we face these adversaries in our world, it let us be reminded that we should do so in an attitude that is becoming of a Christian. I know I'm guilty, and maybe you would attest to being guilty as well, that when people would demean Christ, we would have a demeaning spirit back to that, those people. Can I tell you that that's not how Christ himself responded to those who sought to take his life and persecute him and, and take him to the cross. Rather, rather he, he pled to his father, Lord, forgive them. And that is our model for how we should also take a stand. Because of this, the king once again comes to Esther in, verses, in verse 12. And for a second time, as we saw last week, he, he asked the same question. says, Esther, whatever you want. I'm going to give it to you. What do, what do you need for your people? And it will be done. Verse 12 says at, at the end, Now what is thy petition, and it shall be granted thee? Or what is thy request further, and it shall be done? The queen makes a request. Esther did have two very bold requests. that they was, And that these requests would send a loud and clear message to deter anyone who would consider to destroy the Jewish people uh, for good. Haman had 10 sons. It, it seemingly, based on verses 13 and 14, we won't take the time to read, to read those verses, but Esther starts off where she says, then Esther said, if it please the king. And she says, let it be granted, she goes on to say, that the 10 sons of Haman would also be taken and hanged as a deterrence from those that would seek to rise up against the Jews in the future. Now, I think that this is inferring to that Haman's sons more than likely were part of the group that on this day, the 13th day of March, they were part of this group that rose up against the Jews and who were then destroyed and killed in battle and their bodies were then taken and hanged as a way to deter someone. Esther's request, you think, would maybe... Be, be that of, of vengeance. I, I don't see that at all. Rather, a reminder that if you rise up against God's people, this is what, what is more than likely to come to you because the promise of from God to Abraham and to David were very much still alive to Esther during her day and they're very much still alive to us during our day. That God is not going to allow anyone, anyone to accomplish the task of having victory over his people. He's not going to allow it. Verse 15 says, For the Jews that were in Shushan gathered themselves together on the 14th day also of the month Adar, and they slew 300 men at Shushan. But on the prey they laid not their hand. We see where the Jews, then they, they are preserved. Verse number 16 goes on to say that in all the other provinces uh, that we've talked about, the 127 provinces, that there were 75,000 people whose entire goal was to eradicate the Jews from the face of the earth. 
And the Bible says they were that uh, the Jewish people slew them, and their of their foes seventy and five thousand. You think this is a a tough day? And one day, the Persian Empire loses over seventy five thousand people. But yet, this was a day that marked the end of this trial to the Jewish people, and. What became of that was praise of the Jews. They, they were able to celebrate their victory. Once again, this day, the 13th day, from the time that Haman had made this proclamation, remember back with me, if you will, if you will that uh, Mordecai was in the king's gate. He, he was covered in sackcloth and ashes, and, and, and he was praying, and they were fasting, and all the Jews throughout the provinces were weeping, and, and, and they were in distress. And they were praying for deliverance and praying for Esther as she went to, to be with the king. And now God has given them victory through, through this very dark day. God has turned this day of something that was supposed to be annihilation into a time that where, where he had given them victory over their adversary. And now the next day they are able to praise to God. We notice their praise, verse number 17. And on the 13th day of the month of Adol, uh, month Adar, and on the 14th day of the same rested day, and made it a day of feasting and gladness. What are a couple things that they did in regards to praise? God gave them the first thing, rest. He gave them rest. Is the Israelites went from distress and fear to rest and peace. I don't know about you. But if I knew the day of my annihilation, it would be hard to rest. And all those days of unrest, God finally gave them rest. What a beautiful demonstration of how defeat of evil brings peace and joy. That's a, that's a Bible promise from Proverbs chapter 11, verses 10 and 11. Uh, that by the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted. Man, they, 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 these people were brought rest. You know, we don't often think of rest as being an expression of praise and, thanks, and thanksgiving. But the fact is, it is essential. It's essential. There's, there's two types of rest that I believe the Jews were given during this time that the Bible talks about. The first thing was they're given spiritual rest. Spiritual rest. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9 and 10 says, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God, for he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. That we are given this great spiritual rest as Christians, to rest in the finished work of Christ for us. There is no striving to earn God's favor. We, I, that The day of salvation came for me, and there is no more work for me to be done. For, for that uh, to, to be accomplished in my life. It's not of worse works, lest any man should boast. It's what the Bible tells us. And that is rest indeed. To have spiritual rest. There's also another kind of rest that God is very much about. The Bible tells us that even during creation, and on the seventh day, God rested. It is the thought that God is a God of rest, which also means he's a God of physical rest. We are not merely spirits. We have literal bodies. And God made our bodies with a very much a need for rest. In fact, during a particular intense season of ministry with, with his disciples, uh, Jesus pulled them aside to rest. Mark chapter 6 verse 31 tells us of this event. It says, And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. Jesus himself looked out upon those, his, his close inner circle, as they had been ministering. And he says, look, go find a, a place where really nobody else is. Go, go find a desert place and rest. He says, it's been a while since you've rested. There's been no leisure time for you because you have been ministering. It is now time for you to rest. And can I tell you that if Jesus was concerned about that for his disciples, he, he is just as much concerned about that for you and I. Jesus himself rested 
We find a few times throughout Scripture where Jesus, uh, where, where even during the, one of my favorites is when Jesus, when they're in the midst of the storm and Jesus is asleep in the bottom of the boat. It, it's one of my favorite T-shirts that I see is uh, Jesus loved naps and so should you. And trust me, I do. I love a good nap, and, and I love the rest that comes from it. And God is a God who is concerned about our physical well-being in so much that in Scripture He provides us with the command for physical rest. He was like, I don't need, I don't. Yes, you do. You do. The great general, General George Patton, said, "Fatigue makes cowards of us all." And how many times have you and I? I'm, I'm, I'm speak for myself. How many times have I fallen? and to sin, not being able to battle temptation because I was physically weary. Unfortunately, I can think of several times saying the wrong thing, responding in the wrong way, all because I did not take the time for rest. Rest is an important part of the Christian life, and it is one of the great gifts that God has given uh, to us, the ability to rest, to rest peacefully, with our mind at ease, with our spirit at ease. And then he also gave them some, two of my favorite things, a good nap and, and good food, feasting, even feasting. In conjunction with the rest, the Jews feasted. Esther chapter 9, verse 20 and 21 says that to establish among them that they should keep the 14th day of the month Adar and the 15th day of the same yearly. That, that they should uh, do this as, as, at a, as a time to, to rest and to celebrate all that God had given them. Mordecai had risen up to great prominence uh, in the land of, the, uh, of, of Persia. And he says, look, this is a time to feast, to enjoy what God has done. It's funny that this book of the Bible started with a different type of feast. It started with a wicked feast. That, that, that was not honoring of God. And it is ending with a, with a feast that is celebrating God. You know, I, some of my favorite days, some of my favorite days, I looked at it, and that was a good day, was a time of, of praise and rest and, and good food, <laughs> of, of, of a replenishment of, of our body. We see here where they make that a proclamation, a, the pondering of the Jews. The celebration was not going to end that one at our night. The feast was really only beginning of more feasts to come. In fact, verse 22 tells us about the introduction of this new Jewish holiday. This holiday that is mentioned in verses 22 through 30 that is still, once again, celebrated today. It is called Purim. It is celebrated each and every March. Over the last few years, uh, last year it was celebrated March 6th and 7th. This past year, it was celebrated sunset March 23rd because the Jewish day starts at 6 p.m. all the way to nightfall March 24th. The year after will be the 13th, 4th. And so it depends on just the Jewish calendar is a little bit different than ours. But it is still celebrated today. And it is celebrated much like a celebration that we would think of. And uh, um, it, it's interesting what all that they do. It's, it's almost always celebrated in March. It does get into February sometimes just based on their calendar. The celebration starts in the synagogue. Uh, they listen to the entire book of Esther read twice. The entire book. They, they sit and listen to it uh, read twice. And every time Haman's name is even mentioned, uh, they will rattle noisemakers or, or stomp their feet to dishonor his evil name. Purim is also a time uh, to, to, to the needy, sending food or, or uh, they, they tend to the, to the needs of those that don't have much. They send food gifts to friends and feasting with friends and family. On this day of remembering a time the Jews needed to band together, the Jews celebrate by thinking of others and enjoying the company of close friends. Sounds like uh, celebration that we uh, celebrate here in America. We'll get to that here in just a minute when we close. But it was a good day, is what the Bible calls it. Verse 22, from morning to a good day. From sorrow to joy, from morning to a good day. And what this does, and in this celebration, we find the pattern to celebrate God in the midst of a victory that he has given us. If we have a tough time celebrating God's goodness to us, it's because we have been, been, been made blind 
by the things of this world thinking uh, and, and, and the criticisms that we hear and we have developed a critical spirit. I don't want a critical spirit. I, I want a spirit of, of rejoicing and praise uh, to God. What makes a good holiday? Gladness. We see that. From morning to a good day. Feasting. That they should make them days of feasting and joy. Gifts and, and of sending portions one to another. Once again, it's a thought, thought of thinking of others. Uh, benevolence and these gifts to the poor. Thinking about those that can't even give a gift themselves. And, and this celebration, this, this holiday called Purim, was certainly a great day. But there was clear purposes of this day. It was a purposeful holiday. This, this holiday was to make them remember. To remember we all understand the most significant days of, in human history. Sometimes they become merely dates. One of the most significant days of, of my lifetime was September 11th. And I think about this in regards to this lesson because the moniker of September 11th many times is, we'll never forget. We'll never forget. Can I tell you that it certainly seems like we have forgotten like we've forgotten the events that took place that day. And it's become simply a page in the history book. Esther, they, they warn against this. That this doesn't become just another day. Rather, this comes a, becomes a day of establishing the celebration of Purim as a day of remembering God's deliverance. That they first, we'll go through these swiftly, that first they remember the trial. Remember the trial. 20, verse 24 says, because Haman. Re remember. Remember what, what God allowed. Once again, we talked about it. God could have simply just taken Haman's life. He could have made him stop breathing right, right then. But God allowed things to take place in order to bring them through this trial. Remember the trial. Remember the deliverance. Remember the day that you're delivered out of the trial. Remember what God did in regards to, to uh, taking Esther uh, from where she was, the orphan girl, to the house of Mordecai and into the palace and, and as queen. And all the things that God did for deliverance, remember those things. Remember the safety that God had provided you. Remember that. And then remember the blessings. Remember the blessings of God. And, and friend... That's the same message to us today. Remember the blessings of God. Ingratitude is just as contagious as gratitude. Ingratitude sneaks into our conversation so easily. The Israelites saw that God directly intervened for them. He answered their pr prayers and delivered them from the Lord, or delivered them from their enemies. These are all blessings from the Lord. But many times we forget the blessings of God. And ingratitude comes into our life and it leads to a critical spirit. You say, how do I keep from that? I gotta have gratitude. One of my favorite songs that we've, seen, we've sung here recently is named just that. We sang it this past Sunday morning. That we have gratitude. That sometimes we just throw up our hands and, and, and praise the Lord. Blessings should be remembered. It was on November 26th. Uh, 17, or excuse me, on October 3rd, 1789, for November 26th of that same year, that George Washington said this, Whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the province of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly to implore His protection and favor. And whereas both houses of Congress have, by their joint committee, requested me to recommend to the people of the United States a day of public thanksgiving and prayer to be observed by acknowledging with grateful hearts the many and signal favors of Almighty God, especially by affording them an opportunity peaceful, peaceably to establish a form of gov government for their safety and happiness. And what a great proclamation that was. But unfortunately... Thanksgiving did not become an annual holiday until much later. In fact, it came about in 1841. And it was by the direction 
of a magazine editor named Sarah Joseph Hale. Sarah jo Josepha Hale. She believed that they of Thanksgiving might unite what was becoming a divided nation. And finally, in 1863, President Lincoln declared Thanksgiving to be a national holiday. What Sarah Hale saw was she saw something we often miss, that intentional thanks to God can foster unity and many times avert disaster. Ingratitude is a sign of disunity, and gratitude is something that fosters unity. For these people, the Jewish people, they were unified on this day in their celebration. They had a great celebration. They had a day, a day of rest. They had a day of feast. They had a day of gifts and, and all these different things to celebrate God. They did it in the right spirit. They allowed it to affect their spirit. You know, is there something troubling your spirit today? Is your heart maybe discouraged by a season of difficulty that, that you have gone through some very dark days? Remember, <laughs> God is a good God. And you can celebrate Him. You can remember that whatever you're facing, whatever trial you're going through, very simply this, the title of our lessons, God's Got This.